Uh, we're going to finish up the book of 1 John tonight. So I hope it's been profitable and helpful to you. I know it has been to me. And um, tonight we're going to talk about Christ, our confidence before God. Christ, our confidence before God. But uh, let's pray together one more time. Father, we, we thank you now for this opportunity to hear from you, and we do pray, God, that that's what happens. Pray that you would open your scripture to us through uh, what, what you have written through the Apostle John, inspired by your Holy Spirit, uh, 2,000 years after his passing, Lord, uh, his words still speak to us. And so I pray, Lord, that um, our hearts and our minds would be com- comforted and warmed and strengthened by the immutable fact that in Christ uh, we have unshakable confidence before you. So, Lord, bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Um, and thinking about Christ, our confidence before God, um, if, you, if we reflect on the book of Genesis and the primordial sin, uh, Adam and Eve ate the fruit, um, but before they did that, the Bible says something quite striking and interesting. It says that uh, they walked with God, of course, and it says that they were naked and not ashamed. But the strange thing was is that when they sinned against God, the way the Bible describes it is it says, and they knew that they were naked. Uh, something had happened. Something had changed. Uh, they, be- they were no longer innocent, as it were. They were now conscious of their nakedness. And I know before that they were na- with them being, you know, it's kind of strange to us, but them being naked was no problem until they realized They were naked. You see, before they had no guilt. They had no shame. They had no sinful self-awareness. It was just free and full unfettered fellowship with God. No reason to distrust or dislove God and no reason for God to distrust uh, his human creatures. But then when sin entered the world, that, that all changed. And now all of a sudden, the intimate relationship with God, the confidence that they had before God was gone. So what did they do? They hid from God, the God that they once had unfettered fellowship with, the one that they used to run to when they heard him walking in the garden, they now hid from. Why? Because they knew they were naked. They were ashamed. And you see, we feel that same weight. Those who rightly see God and rightly understand who he is in his holiness and in his purity, if we have the grace to see that, then we feel that same weight that Adam and Eve did. We, we see our sinfulness in view of his holiness, and, and, uh, and sometimes we wonder, you know, uh, you know, why should God actually love us? Why should God hear our prayers? Why should we have hope that we could be any better than we are? If we see God as he is, then we want to hide from him. And I want to suggest this evening that Christ has come to restore, to become our confidence before God. And that's what I want to talk about this evening, 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. And so if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God 
protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. Who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. The Word of God. You may be seated. I want to see three uh, truths from our passage this evening. Number one, Christ, our confidence in prayer. Christ, our confidence in prayer. Number two, Christ, our confidence in failure. Christ, our confidence in failure. And number three, Christ, our confidence in the world. Christ, our confidence in the world. But first, Christ, our confidence in prayer. We see this in verses 13 through 15. Uh, with these final reminders and exhortations, John concludes his letter that we've worked through for some time now. And John begins by restating uh, one of the primary purposes he has written in this letter. And of course, it's a helpful way to explain things and to teach, and it helps us to reflect then at the end of the letter on what John has been intending to communicate this whole time. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That's, that's why he's written this letter. That's what he wants them to know. He wants them to know that they have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? Some people question if you can know. The Bible says you can know if you have eternal life. If you don't know tonight, I want you to know. I want you to know. You see, as we reflect on the letter, we understand what John has been getting at this whole time. He wrote this letter to reassure them, to strengthen them. A, uh, a group of uh, people had defected from the Christian community and embraced this false teaching, a false understanding of Christ, a false gospel. And yet, of course, they were claiming that they knew God, that they had the real access to the truth, that they had the true understanding of who Christ is uh, and was over and against this other community. And of course, this, these people, you know, they went to church together. They were friends. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're gone. And they're wondering, well, do they know something we don't know? What if, what if they know something we don't? How do I know that? How would I know that? Am I, do I really know Jesus like I think I do? And John wants to reassure them, to strengthen them, to tell them the truth. That it is they who believe in the truth about the Son of God. Jesus in the flesh. Christ from beginning to end as we talked about. Not just by water, but by water and the blood. That it is they who believe in the true name of the Son of God. They have eternal life. You have eternal life. If you believe in the true name of the Son of God. He wants to reassure them and strengthen them over and against those who were once among them but had left them and had embraced a false Jesus. And there are many today, church, who are indeed embracing a false Jesus. It is tempting, church, to believe in a Jesus who affirms your sins, a Jesus who is palatable to your taste buds and doesn't de demand self-denial and cross-bearing. Everyone wants a Jesus like that. It's tempting to believe in a religious guru rather than the risen Lord of all. But John is telling them, he's saying, but it's you, church, who believes in the true Christ, the one who was Christ from beginning to end, the one who, as he says in this passage, the one who is the true God and eternal life. If you believe in him, then regardless of what anyone else says, you can know that you have eternal life. And the others tragically do not. And so he wants to comfort them. He wants to comfort the church. If you have nothing else in this world, if you have the true Christ, then you have eternal life. And that is enough. Jesus, uh, uh, John wants them to truly know this and to take heart. And throughout the letter, he 
as we discussed, that he gave us three tests by which to examine ourselves and by which to examine others who proclaim uh, things about Christ. These tests can uh, help us understand and know what is true. Do we obey God? That's one of the tests. Do we obey God? That's how we know if we're of God or not. That's what John has been saying. If there was someone who claims to be from God, but they don't obey him, don't listen to what they have to say. Do we love others, specific, especially believers, followers of Jesus Christ? Do we love other Christians? Is that love manifest in our lives? Do we love the true community of faith? Someone who says, oh yes, I know God, but there's no manifest love for other followers of Christ in their life? I think John would say, well, I'm not sure you should listen to what they have to say about God. And not only that, but the final test is the doctrinal test. Do you believe the truth? Do we believe the truth about Christ? Does, does the Christ that we believe in just happen to agree with everything we already believe? Or is our Christ the risen Lord of all? The one who we don't tell, what he, we don't tell him what he must be like, but he has the authority to tell us what we should be like. Do we believe in the Christ who is risen from the dead, the, the manifest physical God in flesh, the one whom John said, whom we touched, whom we handled with our hands, whom we saw with our own two eyes, and the one that John proclaims to us, the manifest physical Christ who is resurrected now at the right hand of the Father and who will descend in his physical body from heaven one day for every eye to behold. Do we believe the truth about Christ? And John says, if we do, if we obey God, if we love the brothers, if we believe the truth, then you can know. You can know that you have eternal life. And John grounds all these things, that we, as, we, as we have talked about often, he grounds all these things in being born of God. All these things are the fruit of being born of God. And if we have been born of God, then these things will bear out in our lives and we can know that we have eternal life. So John closes this letter. He wants to give us confidence in specific areas of the Christian life, I believe, as he closes with these final exhortations. And the first area in which he wants to give us confidence is the area of prayer, is the area of prayer. Jesus had ultimate confidence in his prayer life because he is the true son of God, asking the Father according to the Father's will. So Jesus Jesus had perfect confidence, had this great perfect confidence in his prayer life because he, he was the son of the father. And he always asked according to the father's will. And that's the stipulation that John uh, gives us. If we ask anything, verse 14, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. You see, part of being, you know, we have to, we have to keep it in context. John has just, he's hammered. That the Christian life is born, uh, is, is, is produced out of us being born of God. And for John, of course, his anal he follows that analogy. Because if you're born of God, that means you are a child of God. Just as he, Christ, is the son of God. And so a true child of the Father is one who has the Father's spirit. Who is being changed into the likeness of the Father, the likeness of the Son. A true child of the Father then begins to want what the father wants. A true child of the father begins to be interested in the father's interests, concerned about the father's concern. That's how you know, because like father, like son, like father, like daughter. We begin to bear his likeness. We begin, we begin to bear his image. That's part of John's understanding of being born of God. When we became a Christian, God began working in us to no longer want the things we used to want, can I get a witness? But now he works in us to want the things that he wants, believing that and experiencing that his will is best and leads to the greatest and purest and fullest joy that we can imagine. And believing in the Son, uh, the Bible teaches, unites us 
to him. So we stand before God in prayer, as it were, not just in ourselves, but we stand before God, as it were, in our prayers, hidden in Christ. That's the way Paul puts it. We are hid in Christ, asking our pleas through Christ for his namesake, right? That's why John in his gospel taught that we were to pray. Jesus taught us to pray in his name, right? Because we don't just pray for our sake, but we pray for Christ's sake. And we pray in Christ's name, and we pray through Christ's work, Right? So we don't have confidence in ourselves to approach the throne of grace boldly. In of ourselves, we have confidence in Christ to approach the throne of grace. So I don't, I don't presume to run up to God and ask him whatever I want, but I presume to run up to God through Christ because Christ has lived a life without sin. Christ has cleansed me. And, per, and, for, and forgiven me and cleansed me of my guilt and my shame so that I no longer have to hide from God. But I can now walk with him. I can now run to him as at first, as it was meant to be. Because I am through Christ, I am his child. I am hidden in Christ. We now petition God as in the very shadow of Christ. Christ appealing to God for us. That's what the Bible teaches. He intercedes for us. And note that John says that such confidence prayer is made according to God's will. According to God's will. So as we are, as we mature in our faith and as we walk closer with God, our mind, you know, Paul says, to be transformed by the renewal of our mind, we begin to think more and more like God thinks. We begin to want more and more what God wants. So the longer we walk with God, the more our wants and desires and passions are tuned to God's. And to Christ. And this, this uh, what John is saying here is that confident prayer is made by prayer according to God's will as our minds are saturated with God's truth and with God's scripture because that's how we learn. God's mind is through his word. He's revealed his will and his mind and his thoughts and his work and history through his scripture. And as we saturate our mind with the scriptures and study his word, we begin to think like God and we can know, we can know what God's will is. And as we pray for that, we can have unbelievable confidence in our prayer life. But what this also teaches us is that we cannot use prayer as some kind of coin put in a vending machine to get from God whatever we want. That's not how God works. God's not a genie to fulfill your desires for your life. We exist to fulfill God's plans for the world. The the cosmos is not about us it's about God. And we and God is not God doesn't exist to fit into our plans. We exist to fit into God's plans. But if we embrace that and cherish that and believe that, God will use us in his plans in unbelievable ways. And so prayer then is 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 acting out of our position of having been placed in an intimate familial relationship. With God Almighty, we approach God as his children through Christ. And therefore, Christ is our confidence in prayer. What are some of the things that we can pray for with such unshakable confidence according to God's will? Well, to uh, most clearly, we can look right there in John's letter and, and learn from him in this same letter. What are some of these things are? One thing, for example, that we can pray for with unshakable confidence This is astounding. Forgiveness of sin. 1 John 1, 9, he already said it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you, in your heart of hearts, truly confess and repent of your sins, you, and you ask God, God, for Christ's sake, forgive me of this sin. You don't have to wonder if your sins are forgiven. You can know. You can have full and total and unfettered confidence that your sins are forgiven through Christ because God has already said that they are. And when you pray according to God's will, God, forgive my sin. He will, and you can know that your sins are forgiven. Another thing, another thing that we can pray with such confidence through Christ for 
is for holiness. It's for holiness. All throughout this letter, John has emphasized that those who have been born of God will not continue in sin. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is God's will for us. And so, as Christians, the desire of our hearts is to put sin to death. And one of the bane of Christian existences is getting to the end of the day and you reflect on how today went and how you responded to your spouse or how you responded to your kids or a coworker or the thoughts that you thought throughout the day and you reflect on your day and you think, God, I blew it. And yet, at that same time, we can pray and say, God, forgive me, as we just said, but then we can also pray, God, according to your will. Free me from the grip of sin. And he will. And you never have to wonder if God will answer that prayer. You never have to wonder if God will work it. Doesn't mean it won't be painful. Doesn't mean it'll happen as quickly as you want it to. But it will happen. We can pray according to God's will for holiness, for obedience, for purity, for courage, for a new mind, for new thoughts. For the strength to do what is right to do when it is hard to do it. We can pray and God will answer because he delights. And it is his will that we obey him. The final thing that we can pray for right from John's letter here is pray for wisdom and for understanding of the truth. In this letter, John has talked about the spirit is um, the agent of new birth. He is the uh, anointing which teaches us all things. In life, we need wisdom. In life, we need understanding. As Christians, we want to know God more fully, and we want to know him more deeply. And sometimes we read the Bible, and we're just, (laughs) we're confused, and we don't, you know, it doesn't make sense, or it's hard to understand, and that doesn't mean there's hard, there, there is hard work that We'll go in the Bible study, but at the same time, the only way we can understand any of it is through spiritual illumination. And in this very passage, in verse 20 there, it says, We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. So understanding of the truth and understanding of His Word comes from God. And if you, if you want to know God more, you can! You can cry out to God and say, God, help me know you. Help me read your word and understand it. Help me commune with you. Help me know your ways and understand you. And he will. As I mentioned before, my mentor, he he said, he said, he said, we have as much of God as we want. God is not, God is not just, he's, he's not like, you know, just trying to keep himself from us. He has given us. Everything in Christ Jesus. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God gave us his son Jesus, is he going to keep something else from you? If you want it, he'll give it. And if we ask him, he will give us understanding, knowledge of him, understanding of the truth, knowledge of Christ. So number one here is that Christ is our confidence in prayer. He's our confidence. We can have unbelievable confidence in prayer as we cry out to him according to his will. Number two, Christ our confidence in failure. Christ our confidence in failure. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin that does not, a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. And so, after explaining the confidence that we can have as children of God in prayer, he moves on to give uh, really an example of the confidence that we can have in prayer, because he says if we see someone sinning, uh, if we see someone sinning, a brother committing sin that's not leading to death, we will ask and God will give him a life. So this is another thing that John is saying, an, an example of confidence in prayer. We can pray for our brothers and sisters in sin, and John is saying God will answer that prayer. That's astounding. 
So this is one of the, the this is one of these prayers according to God's will to pray, to pray for brothers and sisters who are in sin. And we can have confidence that God will hear such prayers and give them life. In the, the context, it seems to me, the life refers to eternal life. And that by giving them life, I mean, it seems, so uh, it, it seems to me that uh, we have to understand it to mean that it is, re, uh, John is referring to their reconfirmation of, the, uh, of their position in the true community of Christ by their, uh, by their repentance and turning uh, from sin. So he refers to them there as brother, right? And so consistently throughout the letter, brother refers, except in one place, brother refers to a fellow believer. And so he refers to him as brother. So it seems to me that, Paul, uh, that John is understanding this person as a brother. And, that, and, and because of that, we can pray with confidence, knowing that God will hear such prayers and will give them life. And that is give them repentance, and give them grace to turn from that sin and return to the Christian community. Because it's only when one is walking in holy fellowship with the true community of faith that we can have confidence that that person truly has life. I, I believe that's quite clear in John's understanding. Someone, someone who is walking in sin is walking. Sin separates us both from God and from his people. So to walk in sin is to be separate from both God and his people. And so someone walking in separation from God and his people, we can have no confidence then that that person has eternal life. That's what John is saying. But if they are a brother, we can pray for them and God will hear and God will bring them back. Uh, it's interesting that James, at the very end of his letter, seems to make a similar connection between prayer and restoration. In James 5, 17, it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And so... There seems to be, in James's mind, at least in some way in his flow of thought, a connection between prayer and the restoration of a wandering uh, brother or sister. And so we have this example and this command from John to pray for those in sin. And of course, we have to ask, which you're all wondering, what does John mean when he says that a brother is sinning not unto death versus sin that is unto death? death. It is uh, debated, of course, what this means. But um, again, I think that by referring to uh, this first uh, person as brother, uh, he's marking that person as a fellow believer. And I think to understand this, I think we have to relook at what John has said throughout the whole letter concerning John's understanding of the believer. And as we said, John understands the believer is one who has been born of God. And because they are born of God, they have been taught the truth by the Holy Spirit. They have the anointing of the Holy Spirit teaching them and guiding them. And then a person born of the God who is a believer, the, they will uh, evidence these three uh, uh, tests of uh, obedience to God, of uh, love of, the, of uh, the fellow Christians, and of uh, belief in the truth. So... This person in John's understanding of a believer or a brother is someone who has been born of God. They were supernaturally born of God. And I believe John understands that having been thus born of God, they will ultimately, ultimately remain and endure within the true community of faith. I think we can see this from what John said in chapter 2, verse 19. He said, they went out from us, but... They were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. And so it seems to me a clear implication that John's understanding of a brother in Christ or sister, uh, that a believer, 
is that they have been born of God, they have been anointed with the Holy Spirit, such that ultimately they will remain in the community of faith because for someone to depart from the community of faith and never return is to prove that they were never of us all along. And so all, all of that taken together, it seems to me then that to, the sin not leading to death, I would say, is basically any sin that is ultimately repented, confessed, and repented of. I don't think, I'm not sure that John has something super, I think he has a specific thing in, in mind concerning the sin not leading to death, but I think what he's saying here is that, is that any sin that it, which a brother does not ultimately depart, because again, the letter addresses with this group that has departed from the community. Any sin which a brother ultimately repents of and confesses and turns back to the true community, that is sin not leading to death. And we can pray for our brothers, and God will hear those prayers and bring them back for us, to us. So then what does it mean then that there is sin that does lead to death? Well, I think we just have to account for what he has said in the whole letter, and that sin would be the sin of apostasy. That is the sin of denying ultimately and finally the truth about Christ. And I think in particular, he does have in mind people who have heard the truth. And from what we can tell, at some point have understood the truth and known, the clar known with a certain degree of clarity the truth about Christ. And then after having been clearly taught and understood the truth about Christ, then looks at the truth as it is and says, I don't want nothing to do with that. I've tasted Christ. I've seen him. I understand the claims, and I don't want him. It's the sin of apostasy, the sin of unbelief. This is the sin I believe John is saying, and that's what... These, the group that had defected from the community embracing the false teaching, that's what they had done. It's the sin of apostasy. It's the sin that leads to death. It's the sin of unbelief, of looking Christ in the face and saying, no. This, there is sin that leads to death. And John, interestingly, he doesn't, he says it, he says, uh, he says it very interestingly. He doesn't say not to pray for those people, but he says, I do not say that one should pray for that. In other words, he says, you can pray for them, but he's acknowledging that someone in that state is in a very dangerous, precarious state. <clears throat> and so John puts it very interestingly, but see, John recognizes that not all will be like that. That there will be those who enter into sin that does not lead to death. It's not ultimate apostasy. It's not ultimate rejection of Christ and who he is. John says we should pray for them and God will hear us. And so what this is, is that this should give us great confidence and it should give us an earnestness of prayer. It should give us an earnestness of prayer for those who have entered into sin to, to pray that God would bring them back because that's what John is saying here, that the way God does this is through prayer. And so we should pray. You know, we should pray for all those people on our membership role that never come. We should pray for them, that God will bring them back, that God will bring them to repentance, that God will bring them back to faith in Christ. We should pray for those who have given in to some ten, who sin, who have given in to some temptation, and we should pray for those that God might bring them back. If any of us, you see, it is a miracle. <laughs> it is a miracle that any of us make it to the finish line of the faith. We only do so by the power and strength of God. And God's power is accessed through prayer. I have no doubt that the only reason I personally and any of us have made it this far is because of people praying for us. And so we should continue to pray for one another. And if we do, we can have this confidence through Christ that God will restore. God will forgive, as we've said, and God will restore. So number one, Christ is our confidence in prayer. Number two, Christ is our confidence in failure. Number three, Christ is our confidence in the world. Verse 18, 
We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And so in, this, uh, in these uh, final words, he is... Um, he really says some things that he's been saying all along. He has, just, he has just given us the encouragement to pray for those who are in sin. He has just told us in no uncertain terms that there is sin that does not lead to death. And so that's important to remember as Christians that uh, we're not fully sanctified this side of eternity, that we will stumble into sin from time to time. We will sin, but God in his grace will forgive us and restore us, especially by the prayers of others. But of course, John, as every Christian generation has tried to do, is that John wants to both show us the grace of God, but at the same time show us the holiness of God, the seriousness of God for sin. You see, there's some people, there's some people who feel the weight of their sin very keenly, and those people, they need to hear that Christ's blood is more than sufficient to forgive you of all your sin. And there's people, who, there's people who desperately need to hear that. Then there's another kind of people who they don't really feel the weight of their sin so keenly. And frankly, if I can ask God to forgive me later, then I'm just going to do what I want to do now. And John wants to strike that balance and remind us, verse 18, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. The reason why those who are born of God do not keep on sinning, that is, they they don't continue in sin. They don't make a practice of sinning. When they sin, they they confess and they repent, and by the power of the Spirit, they put that sin to death, and it's not a practice, a characterization of their life. That happens because the one who has been born of God, remember, it all flows out of our birth, our new birth in Christ. The one, the one born of God, but he's talking about something different. The one born of God protects him. He who is born of God. Commentators debate that, but I take it to be Christ. We are born of God, but Christ is he, the ultimate one who was born of God, and he protects us And the evil one does not touch us. You see, Jesus has overcome the evil one. Jesus has defeated him. He he defeated him uh, in the wilderness when uh, uh, the devil waylaid him with temptation. And Jesus defeated him and conquered him by quoting the, the word of God to him. By not putting God to the test by not living by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus defeated him. He was put to the test like Adam and Eve, but he conquered. And Jesus defeated uh, Satan uh, on the cross. The only weapon that Satan has against us, that had against humanity, is our sin. He can accuse us. That's what Satan means. He can accuse us. And uh, that's what devil means. And so, the only weapon that Christ has had for uh, has against us was our sin. But on the cross, Christ took away our sin. So the devil is left weaponless against us. He has no more accusations to make because in Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Christ protects us from the evil one. He protects us from the schemes of the enemy. And so... What practically this means for us is that we are protected from the evil one. We don't keep on sinning. And so, of course, what this all means as Christians is that we don't have to sin. We don't have to sin. We do sin. We stumble. We all stumble in many ways, James says. But, I would, but the Christian, the Bible says, we don't have to sin. Paul says that, No temptation has overtaken us except which is common to man, and that God always gives a way of escape. Always gives a way of escape. 
This is so important. It's important for us to remember because we must plead and believe the promises of God. Because in the hour of temptation, the devil will whisper lies in your ears like, you can't help it. And if I ever, if I hear another Christian, a Christian say, I couldn't help myself, I'm just going, my head's going to explode. You can't help yourself because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He has conquered. So we don't have to sin. We don't have to sin. But of course, we always remember as well as John reminded his people in 1 John in in 2 1, my little children, I'm writing to these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so we see the balance that John is trying to make there. And finally, John uh, concludes by saying that Christ has given us understanding. Christ has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. You see, Jesus is the fullest revelation of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way to God, and it is through Jesus Christ. If we know Christ, the Bible says we become in him. We receive him. And Jesus says, whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. To be united with Christ is to be united with the Father. And it's Christ who has given us this understanding. That is, it's, it's the grace, it's the anointing, it's the, Paul calls the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Christ gives us the understanding to know him who is true. And if we know him who is true, we are in him and we know that he is the true God. Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life. And finally, as we close, and as John closes out the letters, he says, little children, keep yourself from idols. If you've ever read the book, you get to this last verse and you're like, what just happened? He hasn't talked about idols this entire letter. Why would he close the letter by saying, little children, keep yourself from idols? But maybe he closes the letter with this phrase because then he wants us to look back at the letter and realize maybe he's been talking about idols the whole time. You see, these defectors, they had defected. And they had, they had defected to what? A false view of Christ. What's a false view of Christ? It's an idol. They, they were embracing sin because John is just hitting a, a one born of God. Does not sin, does not sin, does not sin. So obviously they were sinning. What, is, what, is, what are we doing when we sin? We're worshiping something. Thinking if I embrace this sin, it'll make me happy. Well, whatever you look to to make you happy is your idol. Maybe what John has been talking about this whole time is idolatry. Maybe he wants us to take our eyes off all the things that this world says is going to make us happy. All the false Christs that demand nothing of you and agree with everything you already believe. And he wants us to look at the one that, to him who is the true God and eternal life. The one who is the image of God. The one who alone is worthy of all worship and adoration and praise. The one of whom John would later see a vision of myriads and myriads of angels in flaming fire who bow down before him who is as a lamb who was slain. And the very thresholds of heaven shake with their praises. If you look to anything else besides Jesus for happiness and joy and peace, you're shortchanging yourself. And you're committing idolatry, John says. But if we look to him who is true, who is the true God and who is eternal life, we can know that we have eternal life. We can know that all the promises of God are ours in him. We can have confidence in prayer, confidence in failure, confidence in the world because he guards us and keeps us and will protect us to the end. So that's what John wants to teach us, I believe, to know that we have eternal life. Do you know 
Do you know? If you don't, you can know. You can turn from your sins. You can believe in Jesus who lived, who died, who rose again, who's coming back. He will, if you confess your sins, he will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and you will be brought into the forever family of God and you can know that you have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the peace of knowing